And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have my good brother as always, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, which re which recently over which recently overtook both get both Ganem Corporation and the rem and the remains of Zaya Enterprise. Because some, because somebody right. <laughs> because somebody had to had had because well af after the headquarters wall blew up, um, stock price went down that and then you can just swoop in and get it on the cheap. Exactly. The one and the bane of my fucking existence. Good brother Xanatrix. We are back with Heavens and Heresies. We are so so far we are uh we we when it comes to these classes, this is our fourth entry, and <laughs> so far we've been th we've been three for three on on classes we actually like, which is saying which is saying something because everybody knows my stance on casting classes and especially my stance on the druid. Mmm, Godzilla tastes yummy when it's cooked well. No, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. If so, I'm pretty sure if someone actually did serve Godzilla meat, it would probably taste extremely salty. I can imagine. I mean, how salty must Godzilla be to to constantly have to come out of the ocean to protect Tokyo? Mm -hmm. But this time around, we have. This time around, we have. A class that a class that I knew I was going to be looking forward to this week, the Petey the Dog of of D of D and D like class design, the class that has the class that has been treated like shit for literal decades. I'm going so far as to say that the that this cl that this class was treated like shit, even ba even back in the days of O D and D. Yeah, I'm going that far. We're talking about the fighter. Now, some may ask, what? Why would? Why would you say the fighter has been treated like shit even even back in the old days? Well, that's because that's because what the what the fighter would bring to the table in terms of in terms of what it had is significantly less involved. They were able to do they were able to do extra stuff with the basic combat system, and the whole equipping any kind of weapon. Doesn't really matter as much when a lot of people are going to have a preferred um, weapon loadout, and are largely going to be sticking with that for the majority of a campaign. Unlike, say, the cl the cleric who's going to get who's going to get all their cleric stuff and and is a decent fighter, or the wizard who has all, who has spells for days, or the thief who has skills for days, the fighter. That doesn't ha doesn't have a whole lot to um, to contrast this kind of thing in the early days. Later on, it became as, as we call as we call it the feeter. Uh third edition. What the fuck were you doing? Mm -hmm. Fourth edition is the is the one time that this curse was broken, and the fifth edition fighter is not is um. Is is extremely vanilla when you're not bring when you're not factoring in subclasses. Because what does the fight once you take out the subclass? What does the fighter really have? Healing surge, or rather, or rather, second wind, which is a poor man's version of healing surge. I'll get to that. Um. The the ability the ability to get do overs on sa on saving throws and get more and get multiple attack and get multiple attacks at higher levels. That and that and get that and getting um, a f getting a fair amount of ASIs. I mean, yeah, there's the fighting style thing, but let's be honest, fighting styles may have, may as well have been feats. In turn, yeah. This is a fighter has a reputation of being. It's for this and other reasons that I've talked about how the fighter has this reputation of being Babby's first class. When, re when really, um, 
I think I think that I think that the fight I think that the fighter the the poster child of the martial based character being treated as Babby's first class is um, a classic case of what happens when you have a when you have a bunch of when you have a bunch of nerds try and make a character all about fighting. Okay, that that may have been a little bit harsh. <laughs> I mean, but is it any less true? Sometimes tr the truth hurts. But remember, also, people, the truth shall set you free. But even even with all that, um, the reason I, the reason I bring that kind of thing up is is simply be is simply because of the whole I do ba I do basic attack thing that um has that has been a meme uh, for me for decades. Mm hmm. And this is what and um. It doesn't surprise me one bit that a lot of attempts at attempts at hackery when it comes to D and D over the years, one of the first targets for any sort of hackery is the martial characters and especially the fighter. Whether whether it's at, whether it's adding more tricks or or something else. Mm. And I'm I'm not br I'm not just bringing up um the book of nine swords with this kind of thing, but also stuff like Iron Heroes. Or even Trailblazer, were had a, had attempts to try and address this particular issue. Yeah, and of course, of course, on, on now granted, um, a lot of a, the main way to make fighters interesting in Fifth Edition is subclasses. But I've always felt that using subclasses to make a class interesting feels like a bandage. Yeah. It certainly doesn't hurt that um or help that a lot of people have this mindset of oh if you oh, if you want to make the if you want to make the class if oh you've got you've got a cool idea for a class well just make it a just make it a subclass of this existing class like say blade singers why the fuck is a why the fuck is a blade singer having to be a subclass of wizard yeah it doesn't really make that much sense mm-hmm Now, that now that brings that brings us to Heavens and Heresies' take on the on the fighter. And um, hold on a sec, I got I've got a side thing. All right. The prop. This is the problem. When, this is the problem when I'm at when I'm in high demand or something. <laughs> hmm. Uh. Don't let it go to your head. Okay. Oh, before before I get to before I get to the fighter, I should address the whole the whole um the whole second wind thing. So one of the one of the um one of the concepts in for, there's a, in fourth edition there's a lot of there's a lot of them to the point where I may as well make a list of th of these kind of things that I feel got uh, I feel got underappreciated in the in the face of my tabletop wow shit and no I am not I am not getting over that because that was bullshit and anyone who ar anyone who attempted to argue that point is a fucking idiot or as well as the whole doesn't feel like D and D argument which um. I don't take I don't take seriously because whenever I ask what do what does I get a dozen different answers, and all and none of them have a whole lot of connective tissue. But the key th the key th one of but getting to the point of this, the mechanic that I want to focus on is healing surges. Every class got a certain number of healing surges. You reco you recovered them at you recovered them after a full rest. You could spend as many as you like out of combat. You could spend one as a as a second wind um, effect in combat that gave that gave you health and gave you a one round boost to your to your non AC defenses. And um, and you could do that sec that second wind once per encounter. Every cl every cl and the whole the there's also the fact that this healing surge was one fourth of your maximum HP. Now, 
fifth edition ha fifth edition attempted to bring this back in two ways. Neither neither of neither of which I'm one hundred percent fond of. Especially since I, especially since the argument has been the argument has been made that it's that it's the same as as what came before. The first is hit dice. Where you have a you have a set number you have a set number of dice based on based on your class that you can you that you can spend to recover HP you get them based on your level. Um, this ends up being a mix of useless at low levels and ridiculous at high levels. Also, also there's the f but unfortunately it is still a die roll so there's a chance you could get a shitload of snake eyes on this and it'd be and it's utterly wasted. Yep. And keep and keep in mind this is a this is a universal pool of di of dice. It's not a set of charges, which is the reason um, Thirteenth Age's recoveries gets a pass. You end up rolling that set of dice a number of t a number of and a number of charges of that set. I mean, I prefer I prefer the twenty five percent of max, but if I have to roll dice, that's a better way to do it. Because at the very least, it, it's not going to be a it's not going to be a death sentence if I end up rolling low, especially since the uh, amount of dice you get for that goes up really damn quick. Mm -hmm. But the other th the other thing is the is the se is the second wind, where you'd get where where you'd gain um one d one d ten HP plus your fighter level once per short rest. Um. Given the absurdly fast amount of HP gain that happens in fifth edition, this isn't it. This is a case of being slightly useful, but not useful enough to actually be actually um, impact or ta or take away from the precious heal bot, which is the big reason why I say that hit dice and second wind are a pale shadow of what healing surges and, and fourth edition second wind were. The purpose of and actually, I think I said this in my initial review. This was a case of missing the point. The reason healing surges were introduced in 4th edition, as stated by the developers at the time, was to take the load off of the cleric. The cleric had, a, had unfortunately been forced into, into the position of heal bot. And... To 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 the point where you needed to have a cleric if you were going to survive for any le any length of time in a dungeon. Healbot or frontline fighter that does more damage than most fighters. That's what that's a different that's another problem. But we'll get to we'll get to that <laughs> when we get when we get when we get to the when we get to the equivalent of cleric because it's not named that. Yes. But. Th but this can but it's for. But the idea of um, of just one d ten pl plus level, um, uh, putting putting aside the whole short rest thing, which we've um we've covered how much we really don't like that. <laughs> yes, yes, we have at length with another hopeful in the valley who was judged poorly, but. The f but the f the fact that but it's a case of th of throwing a bone to an idea, but not but um, not wanting to go, not wanting to go f not wanting to go further because when you think about the idea the narrative idea of second wind, um, as much of a cliche as it is, the be the best analog is the is the um, is the comeback is the com is the comeback moment that a babyface has in in wrestling or the comeback moment that happens. In a um, shonen battle anime, and as 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 much of a cliche as it is, that is that is how you should be visualizing something like Second Wind. Indeed. So it's so it's just giving a little bit of a a little bit of HP, um, what once per once per encounter does not does not ma does not match. And I I know some people will say, but D and D isn't D and D isn't trying to be isn't trying to be anime. Um, you sure about that? <laughs> how many times have we how many times have we heard that fifth edition characters are like superheroes? A lot. Like, if you 
like if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, just go all the way with it. Which is why which is why it's funny to me that I've been coming across um, superhero hacks of five E rules. At the very least, they're honest. Are they now? I could have sworn honesty was was dead. It is the best policy. Yeah, but insanity is still the best defense. Mm -hmm. But with the, with all of that bullshit out of the way, let's get let's get into the fight the fighter that Heavens and Heresies has, and I'm sure it's, I'm sure Tanner is is um has been chomp has been chomping at the bit to see what to see what we're dealing with here, or to see us <laughs> deal with what he's created. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, to start with, we have our uh, our blurb. I get to not try to do a Scottish accent today because it's not a dwarf for once. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Never fight alone. Stand your ground, yes, but stand your ground with allies to support you. A fighter is more than a solitary unit on the battlefield. A fighter understands what combat is at its core. Positioning, tactics... Strategy. Read the movement of one's enemy and adapt. Position one's allies. Attack. Counterattack. Charge forward. Retreat. Repeat. A fighter fights with both her body and mind. What use is the strength of one's arm if one's mind is too slow to read an opponent? Study. Plan. Initiate. Let none stand in the way of your pursuit towards knowledge. Fighters are scholars of the battlefield. They know its history. They forge its future. Izelia Dawnbringer, Felborn Vanguard. Now, I'd like to just counter with, with one word to her statement. Guts. <laughs> yeah, but we've already established that Guts is not a fighter. He's a barbarian. Yes, what I'm saying is that what uses the strength of one's arm if one's mind is too slow to read an opponent? Mm -hmm. um, when you fight with only your uh, your absolute instinct of the battlefield, you don't even have to read the opponent. Yep. Guts. <laughs> Remember, he was born on the battlefield. Literally. Why have why have we not why have we not seen any crossover art with, with him and Conan? Because I think it would involve him calling Conan a bitch. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I think Guts would out out barbarian Conan. But that's just me. Uh, I think Regard uh, yeah. regardless. Any, <laughs> anyway. So core core ability requirements are strength or dexterity and wits. Let's see. Barbarians fight with rage, disciples with intuition, you on the other hand fight smart, tactical, always looking for the advantage to tip the battle in your favor. When you make a skill or spell attack, you use your wits modifier. For that attack, Inter in interesting. I think I think I see where this is going. Um, as a bit of an aside, a big problem with tr with trying to um, with trying to with trying to work with the concept of a fighter is person is person who fights it is a very very wide net compared to other archetypes. Which is which is why when it came to the FF Legend project, how we how, how we solved that with the fighter job was have it that they ha that they have all the weapons and they use all them all the time. Which is why I brought up Furion as my template for that. Yeah. So the first thing that you end up having to do with when trying to address the fighter is figure out what the niche is, because wielding any weapon is not an is not a niche. Just makes you slightly more useful than other people in one fashion. If there isn't anything else to, to supplement that, then you suck in all other fashions. The jack of all trades, I find, I find to be an overrated archetype. Besides, we already have that with our with uh with the with the um skill monkey known as the rogue, mm -hmm. at least in base. Yeah. So, putting that aside, you get proficiency with. The with the fo with the following setup. So you're proficient with all armor and shield types. You have martial proficiency with all weapons. I like the aside here. This includes the unarmed strike stuff. 
Unarmed strikes aren't special in Heavens and Heresies. They're just another weapon type like any others. So, so <laughs> it actually makes fucking sense! Hooray! A fighter knows how to fight with all his weapons, including the things on the end of his arms. His hands. So, remember that joke I made a few weeks back about about a about a um about a monk in full um, a monk in full plate, and that and you yeah. basically you basically said that's a Templar. Yeah, you could probably yeah. you could do that with the fighter if if this is any indication. Yeah, like I said, Knights Templar, mm -hmm. monk in full plate. So then. So for defenses, you are proficient in either your strength or dexterity offense, depending on co depending on your choice in core. If strength is chore is chore. If strength is core, you're proficient in strength defense. If dexterity is core, you're proficient in dexterity defense. If both are core, you're proficient in the defense corresponding to the higher of the two. If both are equal, you can choose between one or the other, and you're proficient in constitution and wits. Um because of, the, basic. because of the because of the way this is set up, I get the feeling most people would end up picking one or the other. Yeah, um, and it's very unlikely with all of the point spreads and the way core abilities work and everything that you would end up with a core ability that are equal mm -hmm. uh, if you chose both strength and dex. Um, for all we know, this may be a fighter that wants both strength and dex so that they can be really, really good at all of those things. Like, really, really good at, at all of the weapons. Every one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and they, it, their strength is probably a little higher. Or maybe their dex is probably a little higher. So, it, it in any event, that's three That's three defense to, uh, proficiencies. That's quite a lot. I think that's the most we've seen so far. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, not even the Barbarian or the Disciple had three. Let me check. If they will open. Please, Google Documents. Open. Uh, Do we have to say open nope. sesame? No, no, no. Okay, so no, Barbarian also has three. They had uh, strength and or dex, higher of two and or whichever is core, um, just like this one does, and, and con and resolve. Uh, but disciple... Was Disciple had three, but you didn't choose between one other. You, you were just outright proficient in intuition, strength, and dex defenses. Interesting. Interesting. Interesting little differences. Mm -hmm. Vitality, half your level plus wits mod. I try to equal to your wits mod. So basically, what we've seen with everything but the druid who casts from Vite. Mm -hmm. Telling you, Dark Knight. It's a fucking Dark Knight. <laughs> Death Flag, though. Ooh. Yeah, there. This is where things get interesting, or start to. When a fighter raises the Death Flag, they and their allies are instantly restored to full HP. Their movement increases by fifteen feet. Their attack and move commands no longer require their ally to utilize their reaction, and they may rally more than one ally per round, and they may make one more attack ch attack each round as part of their attack action. So, when they raise the death flag, literally the whole party jumps back to their feet. Why did they give you healer limit break three? What? <laughs> Healing roll limit break three given to the fighter. Okay. Uh, movement. Now, I assume when it says their movement is increases by 15 feet means just the fighter at this point. Because he did specify they and their allies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because if and then, of everybody course, got 15 feet of movement, that would be a little ridiculous. I mean, it would be perfect for BBEG when you when your fighter's like, Okay, guys, this is the last stand. And then at the end of it all, it's Ashtano Joe time. <laughs> and for all of those who know what Ashtano Joe is, you're welcome for traumatic memories. Go cry in the corner. Um, <laughs> yeah. But that's just like... And then, of course, uh, attack and move commands, and commands we will get into later, mm -hmm. uh, no longer require allies to use their reaction. That's... That's that's insane. 
It certainly f it's it certainly fits the raising the death flag kind um motif. Well, yeah, each death flag raise has been something and in, that just in any sounds other, broken as in, hell. In any other circumstance, these would um a raising the death flag action would be OP. Well, I mean, but it needs to be since you're guaranteeing that after the encounter your character is dead. Mhm. Mm uh oh. Let's see, then you start with one adventuring kit, two weapons, and one shield, or three weapons. Oh, a tier one rejuvenation potion and tier one armor. I think this is the first time we've seen something start with armor. I think so. Again, I'll go check all those fun little uh, things we've looked at prior. Drood starts with Spell focus, two weapons or one weapon and one T1 shield and one T1 potion or poison. Uh, nope, you're right. This is the first. This is the first time we've had one with armor. Yep, disciple and well, barbarian doesn't start with armor. Um, yeah, okay. So this is a, this is the first class that properly starts with armor. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can see where we're where we're going a little bit more with this class now. Just from all this. Uh, all right. So then then we get to first level features. So the first one you get is command. As a fighter, it is your job to guide the momentum of a, of a feat. Your commands allow you to do so. You may command an ally within thirty feet of you as a quick action, choosing from one of the following options: attack. You can command your ally to attack. When you do so, that ally may, may use the reaction or to make an attack of opportunity against the creature within its reach or range. Move, you may command your ally to move. When you do so, that ally may use their reaction and move up to half of their total movement. Or rally, you may command your ally to rally, commanding them back into the fight. When you do so, you may grant that ally temporary hit points equal to half your level rounded up plus your wits modifier until the end of their next turn. An ally must be conscious to receive the benefits of this feature. You may utilize this feature once per round. And so, so removing, so with the death flag removing the the requirement for them to use their reaction, you can just tell your allies, "Hey, yeah, attack," and they do, and it's an AOO. You know what? Actually, Tanner, you crazy son of a bitch! I I see what you're doing here. This is the fucking Warlord. He is turning the fighter into the Warlord class. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it this way. From, from the opening about you are the scholar of what it is to fight, and you do things that are fighty, and you are the one who does all of the things that are fighty, it makes sense. Um, they oversee the battle. And command the battle. Um, I can imagine having a fighter in your core group could be rather powerful. Oh yeah. I um, I think I think it's also I think in doing so this we also and we we haven't we've only gotten into first level and we've already killed off the Babby's first class because again the reason why the fighter is treated as Babby's first class is because of the is because of their apparent simplicity. All they have to do is hack and heal. They're um, if you'll for, if you'll forgive me for re for for referencing my first console MMO, they're um, they're who casts. Eh. Ha. Ha. Ah. Uh. Uh. Hunter casts. Mm. That's all you have to do is just is just hack and heal. Yeah, but hunter casts could also do the shoot and heal. Um, that's that's raw casts. Oh, well, that's right. Raw casts are even easier though, because mm -hmm. you you shot and healed. And for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, first of all, um, does your mother know you're up this late? And uh, <laughs> and second of all, Fantasy Star Online, mm -hmm. the first one. I created a a a, a Newman. Uh, magic user that I named Ifurita because at the time we were uh, we were obsessed with El Hazard. I um, I 
I will admit that I will admit that at that time the the one class that the one um class that I ref that I played the least was um forces. Bruh, you missed out. I'm not saying I didn't play forces. I'm saying I didn't I'm saying I didn't have as many characters that I played as forces as opposed to hunters or rangers. Yeah, a a, fe a female uh Newman force was a was my Ifurita, and she, uh... I got the the ultimate light and dark magics really early on due to some fantastic loot drops. And, uh, well, you know, things just kind of melt. It probably wouldn't surprise you at all if I say if I say that, um, um, Naka's primary inspiration for the game was Diablo. <laughs> nope, especially with the fact that you can repeat over and over and the difficulty just gets higher. Mm -hmm. Anyway, then we have um, fighter fighting styles. So That's a bit redundant. Try saying that five times fast. That five times fast. So you're, you learn the following fighter styles. You learn the following fighting styles and may choose one to have active. You may use a quick action to switch from one fighting style to another. Okay, interesting. This is a this is a massive departure, because originally stance you had, you are you are do you are doing sta you are doing stance dancing, because originally um the fighting styles in in vanilla, were just a were just a set of feats that and you'd get a second one midway through development. Whereas he, whereas here um, you have one two three four five six seven eight. <laughs> Fighting styles that you're gonna be switch that you're gonna be switching between. Um, you can only have one fighting style active at a time unless another feature allo allows grants typo you an you another such as the tactician's protection feature or the dwarven battle training feat. You cannot assume multiple instances of the si of the same fighting style at the same time. So let's see. So we first we have close quarters combat. Also known as CQC, Colonel. What's my mission? <laughs> so, when a creature makes a melee attack against you, it takes bludgeoning damage equal to your class ability score modifier. As you position yourself in such a way that it injures itself with its own attack, if taking damage would kill this creature, the effects of this of its attack still occur. Very, very nice. And because of the fact that it's bludgeoning damage, it's still going to be useful against when you're fighting skeletons. Skeletons are never scary. No, but they are fucking annoying. Yes. Mob mob units are always annoying. Mm -hmm. Counterfighter. When you are fighting defensively, your threat range with attacks of opportunity increases by two. So, when I hear counterfighter, all I hear for all of you... Street Fighter fans out there, Quotes counter. <laughs> Never go to McDonald's with Dudley. That's all I'm gonna say. Ah, uh, but Dudley's a man's man. No, he's a, he's a man's man, but you might get cross. You might get cross, cross countered. countered. <laughs> yep. Um, I was gonna go with the. I was gonna go with either that or um one of the two characters in Dissidia that I sucked at, X Death. Is, that's all he. That's all he is. Is a, or or I should say, in the PSP games. In the PSP games, he was a he was nothing but he was counters all day, every day. Um, oddly enough, I didn't suck as much with Hakuman, who, in um, Blaze Blue, who is also very counter heavy. Weird. They prepped. They both prepped you for Sekiro. Mm-hmm. Um. Next we have Great Weapon Fighting. Whenever you reduce a creature to zero hit points with a melee with a melee weapon attack from a weapon with the heavy quality, you may deal the excess damage to another creature within your melee reach, provided your attack roll would have also hit. Before you before you make a melee weapon attack with a weapon that has the heavy property and with which you are proficient, you can choose to not add that proficiency to your attack roll. If you do so, add 4 plus your proficiency modifier to the damage roll if that attack hits. On a miss, you subtract that proficiency modifier from the total roll of the damage dice before dealing half damage. So, 
Great weapon fighting does is isn't. We've covered it in in barbarian. Yeah, it's more it's more or less the same. It's still cleave plus some um, power attack. Yep. Which, to be fair, if you're using if you're using a if you're using a claymore or a zyhander, um, yeah, th yeah, having having those two be in the same package makes sense. Zvihander. Mm hmm But the Soul Edge. I removed it. <laughs> God damn it. Um You set yourself up for that one. Yeah. See then we have positioning. Your movement speed increases by ten feet. In addition, attacks of opportunity made against you are at disadvantage. So this is the way that the Dread Pirates Robert work, uh, work when they're fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, see, then we have protection. When a creature you can see attacks an ally within your reach, you can use your reaction in order to have that attack's damage against that ally. We can't say this is cover, because you're not taking the damage for them. Mm -hmm. Instead... This is more like shoving the guy so that the attack only grazes them. It's chip damage. Oh yeah. Um Shield Man slash shi Shield ma Maiden. Um bit of a typo there. There's not there's there's only one S in Shield Maiden. And only one S in Shield Man. Mm hmm But he decided to name them Shieldsman and Shields Maiden. Yeah, might yeah, might want might want to adjust that. Once per turn, you can utilize a you can utilize a quick action 10 feet in order to grant allies within 5 feet of you plus 1 deflection until the beginning of your next turn. If multiple creatures utilize this feature, its effects stack up to a maximum of plus 2 deflection. You gain 1 point of damage reduction and it also it also has an additional effect depending on the kind of shield you use. If you're using a light shield, you can you can wield a two-handed weapon without penalty. If you are not wielding a two-handed weapon, you gain plus two deflection instead. Standard shields, if you aren't incapacitated and are wearing a standard shield, your strength and dexterity defenses increase by one, and you gain one additional DR. Tow if you're wearing a tower shield, you are no longer restricted to wielding light weapons, and it no longer reduces your mo your movement. The shield also grants plus two deflection, and you gain an additional one damage reduction. So all I'm hearing is Roman Phalanx. Roman <laughs> Phalanx. Did you ever see? Did you ever see that? Did you ever see that clip of the um, of the kids who had set up a Roman Phalanx? Yes. <laughs> yes, I have. That was that was adorable. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then we have two weapon fighting, or as it's known in D and D, pay to not suck. So you gain plus one deflection while you are wielding a separate melee weapon in each hand. You can use two weapon fighting e even even when the one handed melee weapons you are wielding aren't light. You can <laughs> draw or you can draw or, or stow. One two hand one two handed weapons. Two 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 one handed weapons. Two one handed weapons, sorry, that was my bad. When you would normally be able to draw or stow only one. So basically you get to draw both of your swords at the same time, mm -hmm. or whatever your two handed weapons are. Yep. See and the last one we have is Sharpshooter. You can spend I keep them away from me with my Jurati. <laughs> that Dad, I'm not a crazy gunman, Dad. I'm an assassin. Well, the difference is one's a job and the other's mental sickness. <laughs> you may spend a 10-foot quick action in order to have the next attack you make this turn at long range not impose disadvantage on your attack roll. As a 10-foot quick action, you can have your next range attack ignore the severity of the hidden condition granted to a creature from cover. <laughs> he'll, ne he'll never hit. He'll never hit us behind this. Behind this. Behind this rock. Arrow through the rock. I was going to go with there, either arrow through the rock or um, aim high. <laughs> Comes up on, hits them in the head <laughs> from the very top. Yep. Parabolas, we know how they work. Mm -hmm. Before you make a ranged weapon attack with a ranged weapon, but not a thrown weapon that you're proficient with, 
You can choose to not add your proficiency to the attack roll. If you do so, you can you can add your proficiency modifier to the damage roll if that attack hits. On a miss, you subtract your proficiency modifier from the total roll of the damage dice before dealing half damage, minimum one. So it's basically um, is it precision aiming or critical aiming? I forget which one. The 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 ranged version of power attack. Yeah, that's pr that's pretty much what this that's pretty much what this is. I like this little dev note here. Mm -hmm. Things like disarm, lunge, and trip are already available to everyone, regardless of class. I thought it was dumb that only certain fighters could do basic maneuvers. Agreed. Ho hold on. Golf clap? Golf clap. Let's see. Two thumbs up, Tanner. Mm -hmm. that, that's a great note to have. <clears throat> oh. And that was just our first level features, everybody, with a large section on maneuver on uh, the stances mm -hmm. that fighters can take. Now, granted, not all of the stances here are going are going to be applicable to ev to every build, but y I'd say I'd say I'd say a, I'd say your standard sword and board fighter is going to be doing a, is going to be doing a fair amount of stance dancing. I'd say the only um the only the the a a um, range heavy build is probably the only one that isn't that that it that is that is going to have less um stance dancing they're going to have some but just not it but just not as much i can i could see a few stances in here being useful for a uh, for for a ranged uh then for a ranged fighter then again, counter fighter because I, it's um, just i get i get the distinct impression that the f that the fighter is going to be doing weapon switching. Yeah, but I uh, just if I'm looking at just a uh, a, a set a, a, a someone who's like I'm going to be a fighter that only uses bows and other ranged weapons. Mm -hmm. Close quarters combat. It doesn't say it matters about your weapon. Just if something hits you at melee, close quarters combat works. Mm -hmm. Counter fighter doesn't say it has to be a melee weapon. It's just if you. If you're fighting defensively, uh, your threat range with AOOs increases by two. Um, positioning. <laughs> Moving further and AOOs are made against you with, with disadvantage. Uh, protection. When, it, you, when a, a creature you can see attacks an ally within your reach, you can use your reaction. Because that's just going to be uh, useful no matter what situation you're in. Mm-hmm whether you're ranged or not. Shieldsman, light shields, you can still wield a two-handed weapon without penalty. Bows are two-handed weapons. <laughs> and then, of course, sharpshooter. Most of the stances are useful for even a ranged fighter here. Mm -hmm. so, I am I am very happy. This is a tool set that anyone can use to make a fighter of their dreams. Oh, yeah. And that's, again, just the first level features, people. And as if I may, if I may go on, if I may go on a, on a brief tangent, of for the long for the longest time, the most the most effective way to equip a fighter is um is ba is um bastards is long sword or if you have or if you have the right build bastard sword and a large shield. It has it has the be, has the best bonus is the best um bonus setup for attack and for attack and defense and. And ain't going any going any bigger on either side is going to penalize the other. It is it is it is safe. It is reliable, effective, and fucking boring. Boring. It is the it is the equivalent of musically speaking, white guy with acoustic guitar. It is the gaming equivalent of food speaking. Toasted bread. Mm -hmm. Not even butter. This is not bread and butter. There's actually something there with bread and butter. It's just toasted bread. Mm -hmm. Toasted white bread, specifically. Or worse, Wonder Bread. <laughs> but the point the point is is that that's that's one of the other reasons why there's been the Babby's Babby's first class issue. Um. Now, 
getting to getting to se getting to second level. That then we have the thing that I bitched about earlier on in this broadcast: second wind. Not to be confused with the exercise equipment store. Zan, you're probably the only person on my on my server who's going to get that joke. <laughs> I I actually I there was a cut out there. You you're going to have to repeat it. I'm sorry. I had I had said sec I had said next up is second win. Not to be confused with the exercise equipment store. <laughs> I might be the, I might be the only person who watches your entire fucking channel that gets that joke. I've had, I've had a I've had a few fellow Minnesotans. <laughs> a few people who understand the importance of hot dish. Yep. Mm-hmm. It it's certainly a min, it's certainly a minority, but it happens. <laughs> anyway, whenever you regain hit points, temporary or otherwise, while you have five or fewer hit points, and as long as you gain more than two hit points. You gain an additional amount of hit points equal to your wits modifier plus your fortitude. I think it plus your level. If you gain temporary hit points, you gain additional temporary hit points. If you gain hit points, you gain additional hit points. Dev note: This feature is deceptively strong since being at zero hit points doesn't mean you're unconscious. This is a massive improvement. <laughs> this is well. This doesn't. You. It doesn't spend anything. There's no, you're not spending a second wind. This is any time you gain HP. When you have five or fewer, and as long as you gain more than two. So you gain three HP and at any point you're at five or fewer. You then gain additional hit points equal to wits mod fortitude level, all added together. At high levels, that's going to be a huge chunk. And like you said, at zero HP, you're not unconscious. So uh, you're like, uh, take you, you, you take a simple tier one rejuvenation potion or something and down that. And all of a sudden, oh, I feel much better. And now I'm going to kick your ass. Mm -hmm. uh, that's. Uh, should, shouldn't you just call this eternal wind? <laughs> I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we have a name. I'm pretty sure we have a name for that. It's called phenothaline. Ha! <laughs> oh. Anyway, uh... next we have indomitable. If an enemy would hit you with an attack, you may expend one vitality. No reaction required. Roll one d8 and add your wits modifier to the roll. Your defense is increased by the total against the attack. If the amount exceeds the attack roll, the attack misses you. You may not use this feature on attacks that would automatically hit you. I'd say, I'd say this is a, I'd say this is our, it's a, it's its own little bit of um, of bo of um, pe of boosting the of boosting defense, um. And and what's what's really fun is. It works on anything that isn't a uh, a seventeen through twenty, mm -hmm. and it's really useful if the margin of error is small. Yeah, it's you. It's useful, but it, but it's not. But it's not overpowered. Yeah, you're not. You're not going to have. You're not going to have a case. You're not going to have a case of um the of the tanky boy. Especially since you're spending from vitality, and unlike our our uh, druid from earlier, you have a normal vitality pool, so mm -hmm. you gotta you gotta weigh it. Yep. So then we have action surge, <laughs> and people made and people made fun of iron heart surge back in the day. <laughs> so, on your turn, you can take one additional action on top of your regular action. Once you use this feature, you must push forward or rest before using it again. At 14th level, you can use it twice, but only once on the same turn. You regain expended uses of this feature whenever you push forward or rest. So, 
ex a, a extra action. Nope, no one's going to complain about that. It's the same as Action Surge usually has been. Mm -hmm. Except, uh, you know, slightly better. Yep. Because of have, Push Forward as a feature. Then we have Martial Archetype. Which, which we'll get into. Yep. Then we have Extra Attack at 5th level. You may attack twice instead of once whenever you take the attack action on your turn. Now, I this... This has a more extensive dev note that I want that I want to go into. I didn't like how bogged down encounters could get in TTRPGs because of turns where people attacked 80 times. So, with the exception of a few features, the most any class can attack is twice, and only two classes can do that even: the fighter and the disciple. The other classes deal more damage with atta with attacks as they level, but the goal here was to limit the amount of time each turn took. It's also why initiative works the way it does, rolling once to determine which side chooses an actor to act first, then alternating. Because with the exception that the side that won the initiative roll goes first, the initiative order will change every round. For example, the fighter could go first in one round, but, but the party leader could decide to have them act last in the next. This is intentional. Fighters are supposed to combine this with effects that say, last until the beginning of your next turn to get the most out of those effects. Players, not fighters. Yeah, players. Yeah. Basic, basically, because of the way initiative it can be manipulated and who goes when, you can you can extend. Let's say your fighter is actually in the thick of it, mm -hmm. and they're using something. That they've got an effect on them that, well, reduces d incoming damage until the beginning of their next turn. Placing up the end of the initiative order could actually make sense, since they're sitting there drawing aggro and drawing. Uh, drawing ire from the enemies while the rest of your friends are coming in and taking those guys down and keeping you that, that's that's an interesting little way to put it mm -hmm. i'd also like to point out that at, that means at fifth level and higher if you raise the death flag that's three attacks around <laughs> yes um and then of course if you use your extra action for another attack that's six attacks in a round mm -hmm. so that's that's fun I like being able to hit things lots of times. I remember how much I spammed the multi-hit spell in Fable 1. Yep. <laughs> Let's see. Then we have bonus martial feats. So it does exactly what it says in the tin. And you gain, you gain an additional martial feat at 11th and 17th level. At 6th level, you gain, you gain just bonus feats. This chosen feat cannot be a martial feat. And you gain an additional... One at 14th level, which also cannot be a martial feat. Still a little bit of feeder DNA, but I'm guessing when we look at the feats, we'll see that this is probably much better than we think it is right now. I'm going to I'm gonna say hopefully optimistic, and like I have been with every uh, document this time, you know, in this, in this particular review, uh, I think when we get to the feats and review them, we're going to go, oh my god, if that's the case... Holy shit, what the hell. Mm -hmm. So at 9th level, you gain Rounded Combatant. Incre you increase two non-core ability scores of your choice by two. It's nice. Let's see, at 11th level, you gain Staggering Blow. <laughs> your threat range with attacks increases by one. one. And once per round, you may deal an additional die worth of damage with a weapon attack. You may apply this extra damage die after seeing the results of the attack roll, doubling the number of dice in case of a critical. And at 17th level, you gain Staggering Blow Plus, which gives you an additional additional die. Yeah, you get two additional dice worth of damage during a round. Mm -hmm. And you can split it between multiple attacks! <laughs> um... Uh, Tanner, my my only my only request is for these these chained feature types where you just call them name the name plus the name plus plus. Can can I, can I name them? Because staggering blow then sundering blow. Come on, it just makes sense. In the words of the mop, it just works. Don't make me sing it, monk. Because I will. I'm, I'm not going to. <laughs> Anyway, at 13th level, you gain focused com you gain focused combatant where you can increase one of your core ability scores by 2. At 20th level, you gain battlemaster, 
Not to be confused with the disappointment that is the Battlemaster we know. Allies can make use of your action search feature. Doing, doing so counts as you using the feature, and you gain two martial feats of your choice. Dev, dev note, another reason I don't multi-class in the traditional way. Most classes grant their features to other classes already. Multi-classing would just be a way for people to try and make an island class that didn't have to interact with their party. That's actually a good, a good, uh, good design ethos there. Mm -hmm. Trying to prevent solo play. Yep. I mean, solo play sometimes happens just due to the way uh, a backstory or arc may work, but then you still want the party involved. So. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, there's a really large dev note about the archetypes here. You may notice that there are only a few fighter archetypes. Fighters are made distinct by the many feet choices they get. So, like I said, it, it does have a little bit of the feeder DNA. And the fighting styles they get access to, and more important, I only try to make the archetypes that people are drawn to for the game. It's why some classes have more archetypes than others. For Barbarian, for example, there are a larger number of iconic ragers compared to druidic archetypes. People that play druids tend to want one of four things. A pet nature-themed spellcasting, weird occulty time stuff, or shape-shifting. Though, of course, if someone brought me another iconic druid type, I'll, I'd add that to the game. So, uh, my input then, just like with, the, uh, with our, with our uh, delve into the disciple and the way of the entering fist, um, you need to make a, a, a way of mysteries. The circle of mysteries for a, <laughs> for a druid. I'm afraid to ask, but what would the Circle of Mysteries entail? You already know the mystery of the Druids, Monk. You know the answer to that question. Oh, fuck you. Uh... <laughs> anyway, on to the archetypes. So, the first one is the Vanguard. Quick to act and slow to tire. Vanguard specialize at leading the charge and vanquishing their enemies. So at third level, you gain proficiency in one of the following skills, history, investigation, or persuasion, and you learn one language of your choice. You That's also one of two... Yeah, I was about to say, there's a second third level feature here. Mm -hmm. You also gain fighting spirit. On your turn, you may expend a vitality in order to give yourself advantage on weapon attack rolls until the beginning of your next turn. And this goes all the way back into that dev note about manipulating initiative order. Mm hmm. <laughs> That's at, evil. At seventh level, you gain steadfast. Whenever you use fighting spirit, you may roll a d8, add your wits, and gain an amount of temporary hit points equal to the total. And of course, that can that can play into se um, second wind. I'm at 4 HP. Oh, no. Oh, I gained D8 plus Wits mod, and I, my Wits mod is probably at least a 2, so that's a, already 3 and, or higher. Oh, then I also gained temporary HP and in inclusion of Wits mod plus Fort plus level. Mm -hmm. Was it half Wits mod? No it, was, no, it wasn't half. It was full Wits mod, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, Wits mod Fort level. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, all of that temporary HP. What am I going to do? Mmm, tastes so good! <laughs> At 10th level, you gain Adrenaline Rush. When threatened, the number of... You, gain a, you regain a number of temporary vitality equal to your wits. You cannot exceed your maximum vitality total with this feature, and any remaining vitality gained from this feature disappears when the threat subsides. Yep. So essentially, you can give yourself a temporary... Uh, temporary um, maximum vitality if you've spent some in the battle or spent some pushing forward when you get to this battle or whatever. So you're not at max vitality. You're like, oh, I really don't want my vitality to get too low. What if we do really badly in this battle and then, you know, drains my vitality, my willpower, I could die. Well, I'm just going to give myself some temp vitality to spend for more features! Yeah! Mm-hmm. Let's see, at, thir at 15th level, you gain Double Strike. If you take the attack action on your turn and have advantage on an attack roll against one of the targets, 
you can forgo the advantage for that roll in order to make an additional weapon attack against that target as part of the same action. You do not add ability modifiers to the damage rolls for these bonus attacks, but they may otherwise benefit from features. <laughs> Didn't you say early earlier, Tanner, that you that you wanted to min that you wanted to minimize oh, multiple attacks, and here we have the Vanguard fighter who is getting more attacks <laughs> per round. I'd also like to point out something I just noticed because I'm a pedant. Mm -hmm. um, he accidentally put champion feature in every one of these vanguard features. <laughs> <laughs> Says 15th level champion feature, but the champion's further down, so... We are not the champions. No, we're the vanguard. Mm -hmm. We're in first and we're out last. Yep. But uh, um, that that's a a vanguard that raises the death flag. <laughs> There's a scary thought, um, or ev even just using action surge with this kind of with this kind of setup is a scary thought as it is. Um, then mm -hmm. we have stalwart. Your vitality and willpower scores increase by two. At the beginning of your turn, you may gain plus 3 damage reduction or add plus 1d6 damage to weapon attacks until the beginning of your next turn. Well, that's just not fair. <laughs> I love it. It's essentially a giant middle finger to whomever you're fighting. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then we have Tactician. Which has a nice little... Uh, side conversation attached to it. Uh, one of the one of the uh, reviewers says, "This subclass is everything I want the five E Battle Master to be. One of the cleanest designs I have read yet." Tanner responded, "Thank you. That means a lot. Fighter was one of the classes I really wanted to shine, but not be overly complex." And the interesting thing with that is the is the fact that the fighter, or rather the the we talked about this when we covered the Warlord entry in um, Level Up Five E. Yes. That the concept of the the concept of the Warlord, the the idea the idea that th that they utilize the party as their weapon that kind that kind of frontline tactician was was a was was a case of something that people didn't even know that they wanted and even and and. Very few people have had bad things to say about the Warlord concept. Now, the the um, the Battle Master in in um, Five E as a subclass of fighter was an attempt to what well, has been argued as an attempt to try and be like the the um, try and be try and be like the um, Warlord. But the manu but the superiority die and, and the like doesn't d doesn't make the cut. Plus, I've already mentioned how the superiority die is a poor man's version of the maneuver die concept from the from the original playtest. Yep. But let's yep, see, yep. let's see how the tactician stacks up. Because we are, we already have a little bit of that warlord in this class just out of the gate. So first we have defensible. You and your allies within 10 feet of you gain one additional point of damage reduction. Alright. Let's see. Protection. You gain the protection fighting style as a bonus fighting style, and you may consider your, your reach to be 10 feet longer for the purposes of using the protection fighting style. Except... Wait a wait a wait a minute! I need no, to check. No, I, I, I no. I think what he's saying here, and you may need clarification for this, Tanner. When it's a bonus fighting style, does that mean it's active in inclusion to the fighting stance you are already in? Yeah, because because uh, otherwise the otherwise this is a bit odd. Yeah, because protection's already listed in the base uh, in the base uh, stances you can take. Protect protection style is in there. So when you say it's a bonus fighting style, and this is this, I think this is really a a point of of clarification that needs to be made. Mm -hmm. Is it active in inclusion to whatever other fighting style you are currently using, 
or not. Because if not, then you're giving them something they already have or can switch to at, an, at a moment's notice. Mm-hmm. And the only thing you're really adding to it is 10 feet longer for the purpose. So it's reach plus 10 feet at that point. Yeah. Uh, so clarification there. Um, mm-hmm. This is probably the biggest point of clarification we've needed for a while. Yeah. I, if I have to make that, that particular assessment, I would say that this means you have protection always on and inclusion to whatever your main uh, fighting style currently is. Mm-hmm. But that's just my guess. Yeah. Let's see. Next is formation. Whenever you use your move command, you may have it apply to all allies within 30 feet of you. Ooh. 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 March information! <laughs> and I'm, pre- I'm pretty sure... I would bring up Cadence, but I don't want, I don't want to trigger all of, all of my friends who, who have served... Mm. Especially since some of them have mentioned that, um, as far as, as far as as far as a kind of physical training, um, marching in, for, um, that kind that kind of cadence based marching in formation, um, is actually is actually kind of useless. Like you'd be better served with having people gear up and doing, and and doing um, mock patrol routes. Yeah, but that sort of marching information is is not generally for PT, it's for discipline. There there's a whole there's a whole argument that could that can be made of it that can be made of it. But um when it comes to when it comes to the song when it comes to the cadence songs, yeah, some of them are really fucking stupid. And anyway. Um tenth le- tenth level. Hold the line. We're not ta- we're not talking about fucking hedge funds. No, 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 no. You see, here, let me, <clears throat> let me see if, no, I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. I used to be able to do a Solarian voice, but now I can't. No. But no, Captain Kirihi, hold the line. Bit of a cloaca, though. Yeah. Whenever you use your rally command, it applies to allies within, thir- within 30 feet of you. Which, that's, that's going to be pretty useful, <laughs> especially since rally is already pretty powerful as it is. Yeah. Um at fifteenth level you gain immovable object. You gain an additional reaction during the course of a round. And at eighteenth level you gain unstoppable force. When an ally within thirty feet of you would be hit by an attack, you may use your reaction and grant them the benefits of your indomitable feature. You do not need to expend the vitality to activate the feature on an ally. And for, you know, those of you who don't remember the indomitable feature, that's the same feature from second level base fighter where you can add 1d8 plus your wits mod to uh, your defense. This means and that this means that our fighter can, can even help out the squishy boys if, if they happen to get hit. Yep, and make the attack miss them. Mm-hmm. And so we can see here that the tactician is the true party supporter. Um, just by being near people, you give them DR. Just by being near people, your commands apply to all of them. You get more reactions, and you get to help protect people. Yeah, mm-hmm. this is this is nice. I like it. This is for this is for that guy who's con- who's constantly bar- who's constantly barch- barking or- barking orders during raids. Mhm. Then we have Champion, which the original Champion was just one giant crit fisher for those who want for those who didn't want to have anything interesting in their subclass. But let's see let's see let's see the approach that this has. So at third level, you gain sturdy grip. You can ignore the heavy quality of weapons you wield. The weapon is still considered to have the heavy quality. When you wield a weapon in two hands, you may increase the threat range of that weapon by one, and may increase the minimum damage range of your weapon by your wits modifier. <laughs> I didn't think Chin. I'd see the brutal rule here, but that but that it be what it is. Question. 
Does ignoring the heavy quality of a weapon mean you can dual wield heavy weapons? I want to know this. <laughs> because if this is the case, we're going to have somebody dual wielding giant ass Zweihunders on the on the weapon field using two weapon fighting and and drawing and stowing both at the same time. Congratulations. <laughs> You've made Momonga, the fighter alter ego of Ainz Ulgon from Overlord, using the champion. <laughs> Fucking Christ. I... You, on, on one hand, I'd say I doubt that was intentional, but maybe this will be another case of accidental genius. I certainly hope so. If this is the case, if this is a case of accidental genius, Tanner, you better not remove it, because <laughs> goddamn... <laughs> Dual wielding great swords. Let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> Let's see. You also gain bonus movement. Your movement increases by five feet. Um, at seventh level, you gain battle ready. You may have an additional fighting style active while threatened. There. Oh. And bounding leap. Increase your vertical jump distance by five feet and your horizontal jump distance by ten feet. Not fly, <laughs> just jump good. I love, I love the, I love the descriptor he put in there. Just jump. Like I said, not fly, just jump good. Mm -hmm. At tenth level, you gain combat training. You are granted a bonus feat of your choice, and you increase your lowest core ability by two. If multiple abilities are tied as your lowest, you pick one. Yeah, but then. At 15th level, improved combat training. Increase two core ability scores of your choice by two. And increase two non-core ability scores of your choice by two. Because <laughs> you just want all of the ability score. At 18th level, you gain Relentless. At the start of each of your turns, if you are conscious and have no more than half of your hit points remaining, you regain... Hit points equal to your wits modifier plus five. You do not get this benefit if you're unconscious. This feature can activate your second wind feature. Which is why the dev note for second wind was up there. Mm -hmm. Because at zero HP, you're not considered unconscious. If you're a champion and you get relentless at zero HP, all of a sudden you've gained a huge chunk of HP. And we've looked at the HP pools. They're not very big. Mm -hmm. The HP pools are are rather meager compared to some of the bloating we see in other D20 systems. And, uh... Oh boy, at, at 18th level, assuming you've been using stuff to increase your core your core abilities, like two core ability scores and all that fun stuff, you're, you're probably pumping wits, and you're probably pumping your primary damage. So mm -hmm. whatever, whatever it is, strength or dex. Um, and if that's the case, your wits mod is probably a 3 or even a 4 at this point. So that's 4 plus 18 right there, plus another 4 plus 5. Um, and this, this feature, it's not that this feature can activate your second wind feature. It's that so long as you're below 5 HP, this feature will activate your second wind feature because it's wits mod plus 5, mm -hmm. and you have to gain more than 2 HP for second wind to work. Oh, yeah. And I think this, we can... This, I think we can safely say that the vanilla champion and this champion are nothing compared to each other. Yeah, they're nothing alike. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, though, with the relentless feature, if you're at zero HP and you're kitted out right in your stats, um, you're going to be back at half HP at the beginning of the next turn. It feels like the champion is um is an is for those who want to bring more of the fighter to the fighter. Yeah, it's it's all about the just you know doing what the fighter does best, wrecking shit, mm -hmm. and making sure you can stay around to wreck more shit. Yep. And then we have the weapon master with a dev note saying. I've been meaning to implement this archetype, but I've been busy with other things. I recently finished it, but it is very fresh, though the idea has been around for a long time. I'll probably switch around some of the levels they get certain features at, but the features themselves will stay the same. The third level features are fixed, though. They will always get those at third level. So let's see what you get. 
at third level, you ha you gain unparalleled skill and gain the f and gain the following feats: axe mastery, blade mastery, crossbow mastery, fell handed, flail mastery, polearm mastery, bow mastery, trapper, and unarmed strike mastery. <laughs> That's right, all of them. <laughs> Is this balanced? Yes. <laughs> I like I like the uh, the little flavor text for unparalleled skill. To you, weapons represent a singular concept, potential. You know how we jo you know how we joke that our that our fighter is um f it goes into a weapon shop and and when the, and when they're asked okay what kind of weapon are you looking for his answer the is answer yes. The answer is yes. That is basically what we've got with unpar with unparalleled skill. He is kitted out like a like a nineties FPS protagonist. Yep. Or um or a or a protagonist from Heretic. Oh jeez. Oh. Or a medieval. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Then we have Quick Swap. You may switch between a weapon you are wielding and one you are carrying on your person as a quick action. Zero, zero feet. It's a Dev note: It's a zero feet quick action rather than a free action because if you are hindered for all of your movement, you wouldn't be able to perform any quick actions regardless of their cost, but still perform free actions. Fair, but at the same time, you ha once again we're dealt we're leaning into that whole thing with Furion. Yep, this one is actually going to be Furion L. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure. So at seventh level, you gain improvisation. When you I like the flavor of text on this one, too. What is the difference between a spear and a mace, anyways? When you draw a weapon, you may, consider t you may consider to have an additional weapon category in addition to its normal weapon category, granting it the benefits of its normal mastery feat and the mastery feat of the new category. The granted benefits exclude the initial damage dice upgrade, or plus one additional threat range in the case of a d12, you may you may not apply the effects of a ranged mastery feat to a melee weapon or the benefits of a melee mastery feat to a ranged weapon, so no ruby no ruby shit for you. The weapon retains the traits of the initial weapon, including damage, range, and tar targeted defense. Dev note this archetype is relatively new. I need to double check the interactions bet between these, as there's probably a broken interaction in there somewhere. Work work. This but this archetype seems fun as hell. Um there is a twisted part of me that wa that wants to wants to drop the um that melee ranged restriction, but I get the feeling that would cause some issues with the feats. We'll probably co we'll probably come back to that when we tackle feats. If I might, are thrown weapons considered melee or ranged? I want to know. <laughs> Is... Because if I'm wielding a javelin like a spear and using it as a spear, but then I want to throw it as a javelin, does it become a ranged weapon? Mm. And, but does the spear archetype still land to it? Should such exceptions be made? And I, <laughs> I, I do have, I do want to read the um ch the sidebar he put in here. As an aside, weapons target different physical defenses. It's how I get around not having AC. Some weapons target dex defense, others strength defense, others con defense. Also, each weapon type typo, has su have something that makes them special. Pole arms have increased reach. Axes have an additional threat range. Maces penetrate DR. And these are things they get right out of the box, too. That brings up something else. The, the, um, one of the big reasons why the whole you-can-equip-any-weapn... Um, doesn't doesn't mat doesn't matter as much with a lot of with a lot of setups is the is the fact that weapons uh, aren't usually very unique. For all intents and purposes, you're still doing the same basic attack and against the against the same target number. The only thing the only thing that changes is damage die and some t sometimes some other effects depending on addition if you get lucky, and of co of course if there's effects on magic items, but that's redundant. Whereas here, right. um, I'd actually, I'd actually, I'd actually compare the all the weapon switching you're doing here to the stance switching in Ghost of Tsushima, which was our idea for our for our fighter anyway. Um, that was our idea for the sword. That was, that was our idea That's for right. the swordmaster. 
That's right, the Swordmaster. Well, we went so, with Weapon so hold Master, on, hold, technically, but... Oh, yes, hold on a second. Are you saying that what we've done, and what Tanner's done, is the same thing? Ours is just in two different job tracks, and his is just all in one. Pretty, mu pretty much. Great minds think alike. Mm -hmm. Oh. That that being that being said, this is go th this is going to result in some crazy in some crazy ass in some crazy ass setups, especially since um, you'll recall that I've ranted a few times on weapon variety. Which mm -hmm. spoiler warning, I'm going to keep ranting about weapon variety as long as people keep insisting on do on doing the same old longsword setup. But with this with this kind of approach. Once again, you have a justifiable reason for the for the fighter to have all to have all the weapons. As, as much I, um, as um, as much as as much as guts is known for using the dragon slayer, it's not like that's his only weapon. He has a crossbow and a cannon built into his arm. Built into his arm, you might ask. What is this? A cyberpunk game? No. No, it's not. No, and as we've talked about in the past, the prosthetic arm has historical precedent. Yes, it does. Um, also, I uh, I just went on a little jump, a little foray into uh, into the equipment section, uh, and came past the heavy tag. <clears throat> Creatures are unable to wield heavy weapons in one hand effectively. They have a disadvantage on attack rolls when they make an attack while wielding a heavy weapon in one hand. In addition, they do not add their ability modifier to the attack roll or damage roll of a heavy weapon when wielding it in one hand. A heavy weapon size and bulk make it too large to be used in one hand effectively. That, um... That feature that allows you to ignore the heavy weapon tag! <laughs> yeah, dude! Two-handed! <laughs> two, two, two heavy weapons! One in each hand, because now you can wield them effectively, because you ignore their deficits. There is one. There is one other build potentially that could be done with that 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 you hadn't considered. Oh. Do you rem do you, I? Re I'm pretty sure you remember just as fondly and just as mimetically some of the crazy ass builds in Sengoku so in um Sengoku Basara. Okay, I think I'm starting to see where you're going with this. But do <laughs> do continue. Consider that consider that that um that one of the one of the title characters, um Yukimura Sanada, wheel is wielding is wielding is dual wielding fucking spears. Yep. And let's also not forget um um Mitsuhide Akechi. Or as or as he was no, or as he was known in my circles, Scythe Sephiroth, who was who was dual wielding scythes. Yep. And given the fact that scythes are are piercing, have um have, ignore a ignore um. I'm oh, sorry, maces maces ignore a ar axes have an additional threat range. It wouldn't be too hard for me to reskin axes as scythes for this in that kind of case. So, and now, now I've gotten to the weapon subcategories. So, as a quick rundown, um, axes target strength defense and have plus one to their threat range. Bows and slings target dex defense. Uh, flails target con or strength defense when you make the attack. Uh, mass weapons target con and ignore up to three points of damage when they hit a threat. Pole arms target dex defense. Special special weapons. Nets target a creature's strength defense and unarmed strikes target a creature's con defense. Well then, I, I I have to I have to read these uh these these weapon description these 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 blurb notes at the beginning of each weapon though. Axes, chop chop, go the axe. 
Oh, blades. I forgot to read blades. Constitution, defense, and they inc uh, your deflection increases by one. But the bonus does not stack for each additional blade you are wielding. So you do not get plus three for being Zoro. Blades. They can slash and poke. Bows and slings. Like crossbows, but you need stats. Oh, and I accidentally skipped crossbows too. Crossbows. Foolproof. Don't even need stats. <laughs> and they target dex defense. Mm -hmm. Flails. Because flails are awesome. It's like death on a string, on a stick. <laughs> Mass weapons. Smashy bashy! Pole arms. Pokey slashy from range. <laughs> special weapons. Only for the most special snowflakes. <laughs> Tanner. I can't wait till we actually go in there in detail, but holy shit, those descriptions. <laughs> uh, anyway, at 10th level, the Weapon Master gains martial training. Increase your movement by 10 feet and gain a bonus martial feat. At 15th, at 15th level, they gain shared knowledge. Allies within 15 feet of you gain the effects of your active fighting style. Holy shit. Um, that's that's an actual holy shit question. Does that does that apply to does that does that also apply to bonus fighting styles? Well, the only bonus fighting style we've seen came with the vanguard, so it's a different archetype. Um, dwar dwarves potentially have a potentially have a bonus fighting style as well. This is true. Which not is only does it, which is why it, I'm asking. <laughs> My next question also then becomes, does this also apply to other fighters in the party? Yeah, that's that's something to that's I, definitely something to consider. I think it should. But then you have like a weapon master who's currently in great weapon fighting while another, say, champion is using close quarters combat at the same time. So now it's a Oh man, I am, I'm, I'm having too much fun building these things in my head. Yeah, you just, you just have a, just have a, do just have a dozen weapon masters, all, all um. <laughs> We're all sharing stances. Oh shit. <laughs> that would be that would be an incredibly broken way to ha to have to have a to have a small group of weapon masters all to all potentially using all of the all of the um fighting styles at once. It'd be a logistical it, nightmare. It'd be a logistical nightmare on that party's be on that party's end. But it, but un unless unless this is getting eroded out, that is potentially possible. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Remember, the multi-classing in this game is basically just taking feats that are equivalent to stuff from other classes. Mm -hmm. Oh no! Now he's really gonna have to change the archetype. <laughs> He did. Because it, he did say that this was. He did say that this was um, early on. Yes, but with a party of eight weapon masters, they can all share the effects of every fighting style at once. They can all have a different kit to cover each other in just weapons and armor alone. And if they all take different sets of feats, they can effectively fill other party positions as well. Mm -hmm. And I want to see this. I want to see only seven of them. And and you know what the name of that campaign is going to be? <laughs> seven Samurai. <laughs> I wanted to be a smart. I wanted to be a smart ass and say the Magnificent Seven. Yeah, but weapon masters sharing skills, all of them with a unique weapon. Seven Samurai. Mm -hmm. Um. Although, th although then, although then again, the dr the dragons of heaven and earth all had unique fighting styles, didn't they? Don't do that to me. <laughs> Don't do that to yourself either. You owe yourself better. <laughs> anyway, 
The capstone for Weapon Master is Battlefield Savant. You gain a martial feat as a bonus feat. When you gain this feature, you may choose a martial feat from among those you have. Allies within 30 feet of you gain the effects of this feat as if they had chosen it themselves. You may change your selection after a rest. My idea to create an entire party of Weapon Master fighters with different feats filling in for different party roles just got better. <laughs> We want to share our all the martial feats. Okay, so we pick all the martial feats during normal fighter leveling and with our archetype, and now all of a sudden we're sharing, we each share one of our different martial feats so that everybody else gets them, and we move as a group. Oh, do we move as a group? This would be you, the you... ideal way to make it to make a um, to make a large Sentai group actually work. <laughs> You're reminding me of Chroma Squad. This is a good thing. <laughs> <clears throat> but yes, this would be a good way to make a large Sentai group actually work. Are we uh are we making Goanger? Is that what we're making, Goanger? No. We're going we're going bigger. We're making God, Cure please, no. Why? <laughs> <laughs> because because the only way I could go big the, there are only two other ways I could go bigger. One of them is the wonderful 101, which is kind of cheating. The other is um, Q Ranger. Is Q Ranger, and I do not want to. And I do not want to give a a single bit of fucking credit to fucking Lucky. So give it all to to um. <laughs> give it all to Champ, since he's voiced by Otsuka Akio. You want to know what the be you want to know what the best part about um. About Ch about Champ was, other than the fact that he was a wrestler that was cow themed and voiced by Otsuka Akio. Um, when when that when when RVT was go when RVT was going through that, Maddie decided to get decided to give um Ch decided to give him the Macho Man voice, and thus Championship Bowl from Hollywood was born. <laughs> I mean, there's. There's another. There's another person you could give all of the, uh, all of all of the, uh, um, all of the, uh, the. Are you about to make a Zenkaiju reference? No. Are you about to make a Gokaiju but... reference? No. I was actually just going to say there's. There, I was going to make a. Uh, Common Rider Zero One reference by saying you could give it all to our soldier who became a <laughs> who became a lawyer robot. He 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 abandoned his name Tsurugi to become a Naruhodo bot. No, but he's so cool. Absolutely not. Shame on you. <laughs> but overall, um, I think I think the worst thing that we'd have to say is that there's a couple entries that might need a little bit of clarification. Um, it is very clear that the be the weapon master is is certainly new, but I'd I'd say the only thing I'd say the only thing to consider is whether is whether or not this is going to result in some ridiculously op um bi um setups. Especially, especially when, especially when it comes to looking at um, feet combinations, I wouldn't be surprised if he's got a, if he's got age, if he's got a small chart. Um, when it comes when it comes to that kind of thing. Mm hmm. Um. I think we've I think we've uh, thoroughly torn apart at this non-tested uh, archetype, though. Yeah, this I feel, is. I feel bad for this archetype now. Yeah, you have so many cool things that I want to try out that I'll never get to try out. As a bit of an aside, um. I do think that several of the dev notes that we've seen thus far should be in the final book. Um, in the same in the same vein that one of my favorite parts of the core book for Thirteenth Age are those little asides where they get into the method to their to their particular madness. Um, the revi the revised edition of 
Mutants and Masterminds had a, had a similar thing. I think th I think third edition M and M also also had it, but I don't remember seeing it as as much as I did with um, revised. Mm -hmm. Just just ha having the having those having those little blur having those little blurbs where you can get where you can get a feeling for what a um de what a particular dev is trying to do. I think um go I think that alone goes a long way. Now, with the, now with that with that in mind, um, when it comes to the when it comes to the subclasses, there there might be a, there might be a few that that you could potentially that you could um, potentially port over from from um, from from vanilla Five E into this setup, but a lot but a lot of like but a lot of them not really. Like I was thinking about, I was thinking about, say, for instance, um, Monster Hunter, but no, that no, that one, that one wouldn't really fit. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, with with this kind of setup, you have the um, we more or less have, we more or less have, you know, how he broke down the um, the mo the moti the motifs for the dru for for people who want to play druids for. Yeah. This we have four motifs. The Vanguard is for the tanky fighters. The tactician is self-explanatory. What kind of fighter that's supposed to be for? That's for the that's for the battlefield commander. The champion is for the people who are who just who just want to kick ass and chew bubble gum, and they're, and they're all, all out of bubble gum. gum. And the weapon master is for that in or is for that indecisive guy who wants to bring in all of the all of. All of the weapons, or pl or, or they're like us, and they played and they played way and they played way too much Doom. I was gonna say way too much Ghost of Tsushima, but that's but there's no such thing. Mm -hmm. Well, except except for those except for those bamboo tests, I don't like those. The bamboo tests aren't bad though. There are there are big there are bigger offenders. It's just, it's just the way it's just the way that kind of thing is is set up of um of having to go really fast with it. Yeah, the thousand cuts. You mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's 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 more meant to be um a test of endurance than anything. <laughs> um. And yeah, now um. I do. I do want to clear. I do want to clarify one thing. We've we've talked about how we've talked about how the D and D third edition and subsequently the Pathfinder fighter has had the nickname of the Feater. Um, and I want I want to make clear that it, that having that having a lot of bonus feats is not the problem. Um, a lot of classes in Fantasy Craft have have bonus feats in some form, and it works. The problem was always in execution for the um. For the fight, for the, for the third edition, for the third edition fighter, yeah, you would you would get those, you would get that set of bonus feats, and nothing else. And the problem, the problem was the feat system itself was full, was um was full of more traps than a whorehouse in Thailand. <laughs> and. Look, I look. I realize I realize that it's that it gets a little bit repetitive with me bringing up whirlwind attack, but I'm gonna keep bringing it up because it is the perfect representation of everything that I didn't like with feet chains in third edition and feet chains in Pathfinder. Having to having to pre-plan several levels in advance, and the feet the um. The whole thing, the whole thing with the whole thing with the idea with the idea of the feeder is the problem is not the whole you get a bunch of feats. The problem was always in the execution of that feat system, and I do very much get the fe get the feeling that the martial feats when we get when we get to those are not going to have that issue. We're not going to we're not going to see a list of oh this counts as a martial feat or this does not count as a martial feat. No, it's going to be categorized. I'm fairly certain of that fact. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, there's, oh, but um, 
that's some, that's something that I think needs to be saved for when we actually get to the feet end of the equation. But yeah. so, but um, even even with that, it's not the feeder thing isn't as ex, isn't as excessive here as it what as it was in the past. I mean, for all intents and purposes, you're get, you're going to be getting um. Let me. S Let's see here. Where is the so one um two feet two feet two two feet it's two feet that aren't mar that aren't martial feats and two two more two more from two more from battle and two more from battle master and two and two more from bonus martial feat. Mm-hmm. That's a total of six. That's um that's a fairly reasonable amount amount, I'd say. <clears throat> yeah. As a as a as opposed to as opposed to some other setups that we've that we've seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um Honestly, this is the biggest improvement I've ever seen on the fighter ever. Uh as as I continually remind the monk, I unfortunately never got a chance to play fourth edition, so I can't make a comparison. But this doesn't this doesn't even feel like a fighter. This do feels what uh you keep referencing as the warlord more than anything. Yeah. And, um, and so, mm -hmm. I I like this idea because this idea is an idea that shows that the fighter does not need to be a basic and simplistic class to fill the role of you are doing you are playing this because you want to get experience on how to play it tabletop in the first place which is what i see a lot of people as you said babby's first class what a lot of people try to do is use fighter as a way to get into uh tabletop as a starting point mm -hmm. which is unfortunate because fighter has a lot of stuff it can it can offer oh yeah now, let's see what we've got next. Oh, ne next is the other half of of Godzilla. Is it now? Let me check here for a second. Ah, uh, yes! Okay. Mm-hmm. Our next pure casting class. Mm-hmm. And as we, as we learned with the Druid, there's no such thing as, as partial casters. There's casters, and there are non-casters. And... To be fair, I'm perfectly fine with that. I've never, I've never been a big, I've never been a big fan of the whole part of the whole half caster thing. Lar large, like the idea. Um, largely, be largely because of the fact that the only, the only, t the only time I'd be, I'm ever really fond of of the whole half caster thing is is when um is when. Is when ca is when casting is not is not something that you have to be of a certain archetype to do from the get go when anybody can gish into it. So mm -hmm. the, prob the problem with get the problem with gishing is that you're you're a um you're 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 outclassed by you're outclassed by the fo by the focused and you don't have anything to compensate. Yeah. But that but that is so that is an. That is an issue for that is an issue for another day. So, be prepared to hear be prepared to hear me pick, to hear me pick on the cleric issues and um. Please do, please do not reference the cleric from d the um, priest from Dead Alive next week. That one's a little too obvious. <laughs> and oh, I, you I, know I, me. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do the obvious. I know you're tempted to break out the Alexander Anderson voice for for it, but let's be honest. Save that. Save that for the paladin. 
I think, Maybe I think that'll be as good as good a spot as any to to le to leave it off. And of and of course we'll be back here next week, and and as well as in the coming days as we always as we always are here in the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.